we already took the offering. We already took it. I'm going to talk about giving now. So uh, none of this could really take effect till next week uh, if, if it changes your heart. So uh, please understand, we, we aren't here to just get your money. We want you to be faithful to the Lord in what he's given to you and shared to you. And we know as a church that this is an important part of our Christian life. And I need to say before I even start that Seymour Christian Church is a generous church. And I know that personally for several several reasons. We are a very generous church. And if you go in my office, you'll see all these thank you cards from October, from Pastor Appreciation Month. I have been blown away by the number of gift cards I received during Pastor Appreciation Month. I couldn't possibly use all of the the gift cards to restaurants and such in, in a year's time. I mean, it's just overwhelming. Your generosity to me and the other people on staff here, Adam and, and Pam and myself, is just remarkable. And thank you for that. You're very generous. I also, and you'll remember this, uh, it's a little dark on purpose because there's about 20 tubes coming out of my head in that picture. And uh, this is when I was in the hospital, uh, August 1st, uh, after my, uh, my car accident. I got cards, I got letters. I had men from the church take me to doctor's appointment. I couldn't drive for a couple months and, and you guys drove me around. I had some of the ladies came in and cleaned my house for me. And that's no small feat. I had groceries brought in. I had meals brought in. I got calls. I got cards. I was taken care of so well. I, you, it just blew my mind. This is a generous congregation. So what I'm going to talk about today isn't any new deal for you guys. And look, there's generous in, generosity in other ways. Last year, one of our members had their house had a house fire and it burned to the ground and we gave them that very same weekend four thousand dollars to help them just spur of the moment you guys should be clapping for this stuff and then last year we took in twenty one thousand one hundred and seventy four dollars and sixty five cents in our benevolence fund we gave away more in the benevolence fund than we had come in. We gave away $26,345.68 to local needs, people in need, uh, funeral dinners, all those sorts of things. We're generous. You're a generous congregation. Part of why our benevolence fund is in the hole and some of our harvest offering is going to go towards it is because there's more need than we even gave for, but the church just keeps on giving, and that's because of you guys. It, it's just amazing. We spent last year in overseas missions $71,240.71. Yeah. Yeah, you should be high-fiving each other. It's amazing. It's amazing. We have a fund here that helps pay for our young people who go to Bible college. Any Bible college they go to, we help uh, support them while they go. Last year, we gave $12,240 to our Timothy fund for that. It's amazing. Last year in our harvest offering, last October, 23, almost $24,000 we gave. You guys did that. It's amazing. And probably the biggest thing we've done since I've been here was this last uh, VBS. We had 33 tons of food. My back will never be the same, many of you guys. You're a generous church. And why do the followers of Christ need to be generous? Well, because first of all, we want to be a generous church and a generous people. We want to reach our community with the love of Jesus. And this is one of the best ways we have. And Jesus taught his followers to be generous. And the hallmark of the early church is just that, that they gave in an incredibly powerful way. So this message this morning came from, predominantly came from Andy Stanley's book, Be Rich. I recommend this book for you. If you are interested in giving, if you're interested in, in some advice for your finances, this is an amazing book by Andy Stanley called Be Rich. And in the book, he makes the statement, it's not what you have, it's what you do with what you have. And that's what makes the difference, and that's what generosity is all about. 
It's about what we do with what the Lord has given us. He bases the teaching in this book on Paul's letter to Timothy. Now, Paul wrote, as you all know, to different churches from prison. He was put in prison towards the end of his life. He wrote letters to the churches that he had helped establish. He also wrote letters to some of the pastors that he had helped get established in those churches, of which Timothy got a couple of letters. And so Paul was very specific to Timothy about how to encourage those that he pastored. And specifically, he wanted Timothy to know how to deal with rich people in his church and what rich people need to know because inevitably, Timothy was going to encounter rich people. Now, look, I know there's not not any rich people here today. You're not rich, I'm not rich. But in case there is, (laughs) this teaching is for you today. And I want you to be good at being rich. And Paul wanted Timothy's people that he pastored to be good at being rich. And so he wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 6, command those who are rich in this present world. He used the word command. That makes me a little nervous because I'm your teacher this morning and Paul is telling me to command. He's not saying, you know, Timothy, you should just suggest nicely to these rich people Or, Timothy, you should, you know, you should talk to these rich people. No, he says, command. It's a hard word. He could have said anything else, but it means that it's not optional. No questions asked. And, you know, the Bible just does this sometimes. It uses hard language. And so when we see this type of language, we need to pay attention. These are commands that we should follow. He goes on to say, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share, and to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Now, here's the thing with rich people, especially in America. The more Americans make, the less they give. It's, there's all kinds of data, data and studies to back this up. The more Americans make financially, the less percentage they give. Now, the IRS would tell us that the average American gives about 6% of their income every year to charities and charitable organizations and people in need. But... As the, what studies show is that the wealthier you get in this country, the less a percentage you, you give. That number falls from 6% to 5 to 4 And you would think, you know, if, if I had a million dollars or if you had a million dollars, wouldn't that be amazing, the, the things you could do for people? I mean, I, I can think of a lot of really great causes that I would give to. And so you would think that that number would go up 7 8 10 12%. But it just doesn't, and there's a reason why. And that's because of our appetite. You know, your appetite. I'm hungry now. I'm ready to get some lunch afterwards. I'll probably go to Hardee's and get some chicken strips. I've just, now I've lost you all. I've talked about food. Cardinal rule of preaching, don't talk about food. But, um, so I've broken that. But I'll go get those chicken strips today. I'm really looking forward to them. I'll probably really splurge and get the five-piece chicken strip and barbecue sauce who's with me on barbecue sauce thank you you're the good people here barbecue sauce is the only way to go on chicken strips oh goodness wow so anyway i'll eat those today at lunch and you know what's going to happen by about 5 p.m what am i going to want more chicken strips because i there's no end right that's the way our appetite is i'll get I'll go for a steak dinner, I'll gorge myself, and you know what I want the very next day? More steak. It's just the way we work. And it's the same with our finances. It's like the more stuff we get, the more we want. Our appetite never lets up. So this morning, I'd like us to practice as a church being rich. But you're gonna ask, what is rich, Doug? What makes a person rich? Well, Gallup did a poll, and in the poll they asked Americans, what is rich? And the average American says that if you make $150,000 a year, you're rich. 
I think so. That would be nice. I would like that. Elders, I would like that. <laughs> no, that, that's great. That would be great to make that much money. And that's what the average American says. But then Gallup thought, you know, he was curious what people who make under $30,000 a year think is rich. So he went and asked people who make $30,000 a year or less, what do you consider rich? They said rich is $75,000 a year. That makes sense. If you're only making $30,000 a year, $75,000 seems like a lot of money. Then Gallup thought, I wonder what rich people think is rich. So he went to the people who read, who read Money Magazine. I've never, have, I've never read Money Magazine. I don't have enough money to bother with, right? So, I mean, if you read Money Magazine, you must have lots of money and a lot of time on your hands, I guess. So the people who read Money Magazine were asked, what is rich? They said, you need about $5 million to be rich. Now, that would be nice, too. So what is it? Is it 75,000 a year? Is it 150,000 a year? Is it 5 million? What makes you rich? And I don't know that I, I have the exact answer to that, but the truth is nobody in America considers themselves rich, but everybody knows somebody who is rich, right? So if I ask you who here is rich, nobody's gonna stand up. Nobody's gonna wave their hand. And I, it's weird in America, you know, we don't wanna admit we're rich. It's, it's difficult for us to do that. You know, in other foreign countries, if you're rich, you dress a certain way and you act a certain way. In America, you kind of have to guess, you know, look at the house somebody lives in. Look at the car they drive. Look at the purse they carry. Is it real? You know? It, 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 do they have a swimming pool? Do, do they have two swimming pools? You know, nobody admits they're rich. But here's the, the harsh reality. If you make $37,000 a year, you're in the top 4% of wage earners in the world. And that's about the response I expected. There's nobody out here right now going, hallelujah, I'm rich. I didn't know I was rich till I came to church today. Honey, we're rich. Look at us, $37,000 a year, we're rich. Yeah, you're not really excited about that at all, are you? And it gets worse. If you make $48,000 a year, you're in the top 1% of wage earners on this planet. So if you make $24,000 and your wife makes $24,000 and you make $48,000 a year, you're considered very wealthy. And I learned this very clearly when I worked for a while on cruise ships. I would meet so many of the young people that work there, and a, a young Filipino man, for instance, would come on board the ship, and his starting wage would be $90 a week. He would work six days a week, about 13 hours a day. He would get free room, he would get food, and they don't get the food that the guests get to eat. You know, it's not that kind of food. They, it's okay food. And they get a cabin to share with somebody else. And these young Filipino men and people from different parts of the world were thrilled to have that job. They waited in line for those jobs. They were thrilled to have them. Um, we don't understand how most of the world lives. You know, if you live in America and you work five days a week, you generally can afford to eat all seven days of the week. That's not how the world works. The problem is we don't want to compare ourselves to the poor in the world. We want to compare ourselves to those who are wealthy and say, you know, I'm not rich. If I were rich, I'd have their lifestyle. And that person says the same thing. You know, I want to have a nicer house, a better car. I want more stuff. In Andy Stanley's book, he talks about going to dinner with a couple who in the Atlanta paper, it said they had just sold their business for $60 billion with a B. They sold their business for $60 billion and later that week they're having dinner with Andy Stanley and his wife and the wife leans over to Andy's wife and she says, you just have to be really careful. You're never gonna know how much you really need. And as they're driving home in the car that night, they looked at each other and they said, you know, if they're not going to make it, nobody else has a chance. And it's kind of crazy 
how goofy rich people get. You know, it's like the more money you make, the, the, there's kind of this neurotic tendency that comes over them. I, it's because the more stuff you have, the more stuff you want. It's, it's that principle of our appetite. So rich people get really crazy this way. You know, it's like the more stuff they get, the crazy. There was a rich man up in Indianapolis who just sold his estate for millions and millions of dollars. I mean, the stuff he had was ridiculous. Um, I, here, I call them silly rich people. Silly rich people. And I've done some, uh, I'm good at this, I did some Googling on the internet, and I wanted to find out what these silly rich people do, and there's some crazy, crazy stuff they do. You're, gonna, you're not going to believe anything I'm going to tell you now, but it's true. I promise it's true because it was on the internet. <laughs> now, here's one thing that rich people do. Blows your, it'll blow your mind. A rich person will take a car that runs perfectly well. It's got four wheels, four seats, and a steering wheel, They'll take that car to a car dealership. I know this gets crazy. They'll give that car dealership that car that works perfectly well and a whole bunch of other money with it, and they'll drive off the lot with another car that has four wheels, four seats, and a steering wheel. I know, right? It's crazy. No, there's more. There's more. Look, another thing these silly rich people do this will blow your mind. You, you, you won't believe this. They will wait in a really long line with other rich people to get a, a new cell phone when the one they have works perfectly fine. They'll be in the line texting their friends saying, I'm waiting in line for three hours to get my new iPhone. Can you believe it? And then because they have so much money, they're so rich, when they finally get in the store, they'll give the the person there, they'll give them their old phone that works just fine and a whole bunch more money and they'll get another cell phone that pretty much does the exact same thing their last one did. I know. You're so quiet, you don't believe this at all, do you? I know, it's crazy. It's just nuts. These silly rich people. You guys are so quiet. I know you don't believe this stuff really happens. Uh, there's more. I've, I've, I've done all this research. Look, another thing these silly rich people will do is they'll find a spot in their car or maybe a jar in their house, like a, a cup holder or something, and they'll take all the heavy money, you know, the heavy money. They have so much money, they don't want to carry around the heavy money. So they'll take that heavy money and they'll fill up a cup holder in their car until it just runs over. They're vacuuming it up. They'll, or they'll put it in a big jar in their house and they'll just let it pile up and pile up and pile up because it's too heavy. I know, I know, silly rich people, it's crazy. Here's another one. They'll go to a restaurant and they have so much money, they'll order way more food than they could ever eat. I know, right? And so then when they're done eating, they'll take the leftover food and they'll put it in little containers. Yeah, and when they walk out, they'll forget the containers. <laughs> and they'll sit in their car and go, you know, it's not even worth going back in and getting that food. They've got so much money, they don't need that food. I know, I know, I'm killing you. You can't believe any of this. Okay, here's another one. These silly rich people, they have a, a room in their house for their clothes. It's called a closet. I know. And they'll walk into a closet full of clothes every morning and they'll look at all those clothes and you know what they'll say? I don't have... I know, right? It's crazy. I Can you believe that? And, and I mean, look, they've got, they've got work clothes and workout clothes and after work clothes and work in the yard clothes and kids' sport team clothes and church clothes and winter clothes and summer clothes and vacation clothes. They have so many clothes that they'll take perfectly good clothes. No holes, no rips, no tears. They'll put it in a garbage bag and take it to like, there's these places you can take your, your clothes that you have too many of and they'll give them to poor people. I know, right? It's just crazy. These silly rich people. Oh, here's another thing they do. Sometimes these people are so rich that they'll buy food 
and they won't even eat it. They'll use it to decorate. Look, I got a picture of it. I mean, this is perfectly good food. You could eat this. And they'll just decorate their house with it. I, can you believe it? I, I know. I, you guys are so quiet. It's like you, you just can't believe any of this, do you? Yeah, here's the reality. We're all rich. We're rich. If you live in America and you have a roof over your head, you have electric, you've got running water and food to eat, most of the world envies you and calls you rich. And so to those of us today who are rich, Paul says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. Imagine that. Imagine Paul knowing that a rich person could be arrogant. He goes on, he says, command them, those who are rich in this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So what Paul is telling Timothy is, look, it's okay if your rich people have two iPhones or a nice car. They should enjoy that. That's a blessing from the Lord. But he goes on to say, here's this word again, command. Command them to do good to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. Now, I don't know about you, but if you're making enough money to work five days a week and eat for seven, you've got a couple of days a week that you can do other things with. And we've got some amazing examples of that around our church. Sometimes giving isn't just about money. I don't have to ever worry about our technical things here because I have Jason and Kyle and they take care of those things. They're technical guys at their jobs. I could never do their job at Toyota, but they take that expertise and they come in here and handle all of our technology every, every weekend for us. Yeah. <laughs> That's doing good. That's being rich in good deeds. We have men here who come in and fix the place up or they'll go and work on a home of a widow or someone who is in need and put a new porch on the house. We had over 200 people go to the 1010 event in the park uh, just about a month and a half ago and go, went and helped all over the city. So part of what Paul is saying is, is enjoy what God's given you. Be grateful for that. But... Be rich in other things. Be rich in doing what is good. So this morning, I want us to practice being rich. You know, if you were really rich, if you had a million dollars or $10 million, and I was getting ready to suggest some of the things I'm just going to suggest, you would be so happy to give to those things, you would just start laughing. So let's all practice laughing hysterically like rich people. Here we go. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> I've got so much money, I'll just give it all away. <laughs> so we're going to practice being these silly rich people. I want us to be amazing at being rich. So here's the first way I want us to do that this season. There is a wonderful organization called Samaritan's Purse. It's run by Franklin Graham, who is Billy Graham's son. And every year they do this project called Operation Christmas Child. And we have a video about that right now that Kyle's going to show us. The children received the gift boxes with such excitement. You see it on their faces, on their smile, in their eyes. Some of them, it's the very first time that they ever received a gift in their lives. We always include about a 10-minute gospel presentation in each event. Jesus loves you. That's what Operation Christmas Child is all about, is to reach children of the world with God's love. And we do that through a simple gift. Happy they feel like somebody loves me. There's no greater joy than knowing we're getting to be a part of the Great Commission together. Volunteers across the nation love to spread the word about shoebox gifts. There's no way that you could do this without volunteers. They're incredible. The energy that they have, the excitement that they have. 
I do this because I know it makes a difference in a child's life. You want to make sure that the boxes that we send are something that these kids are going to remember forever. Our volunteers are just incredible people that love the ministry of Operation Christmas Child. This is the Good Samaritan work that the Lord is looking for people to do. When we pray, God takes your gift and he begins to navigate it around the world and it ends up in the hands of a child. God begins to answer those prayers. After a child receives a gift box, the child is invited to go through the greatest journey. They know the story of God and they can tell others by using the books. In the hands of the local pastors, these boxes can be used as a tool to touch a whole community. The Great Commission, we're to go into all the world to preach the gospel, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication, that's what we do. With the sound so ceases to amaze me how a simple box can change the world for a child. You know, every shoe box is different. I don't think there's, I've ever seen two shoe boxes uh, alike. They're like snowflakes. But one thing that's common with, with all the gifts, and that's prayer. We, you see, we ask people to pray. Pray for the child that's going to get your box. Can you imagine millions of millions of people praying for children this year so thank you thank you for your prayers thank you for your support we never have enough boxes we always need more so please continue to help and continue to pray god bless thank you now how cool is that here's here's the deal every year as a pastor i get some amazing gifts. Uh, one year, I got a tie that lit up with a reindeer on it. I'm never going to wear that tie. <laughs> ever. Not ever. I never wear a tie. But no, no it's just not going to happen. So I appreciate getting the gift. It's cute. But all those gifts you would get for people that, you know, they're kind of the gag gift or the white elephant gift, don't do that this year. Take that money and do it here. So how this works is I will have the website link for this on our website and our Facebook page this afternoon for you to be able to go on. You'll click on that. There'll be a little br brief video there that'll show you how to pack the box. And then you can click on their link and you need to donate $9 to them for every box you give. So some of you can afford to give a box and that'll be great. Some of you could do several boxes. I want all the boxes, the shoe boxes, to come here, and we're going to put them on the stage. And so on November 19th, they will all be gathered up. I'll have Adam do this because he's big and strong. And load them in the van, and we'll take them to the distribution center for you. So the date that it has to be done by is November 19th. That's important. But look, you can be rich for $9. Let's all laugh about that. <laughs> no, I mean, this should be an amazing thing for us. Like I said, I will get the link for you to be able to go online. If some of you don't have internet, we'll set up a, a spot here in the church with a computer hooked up so you can pay your $9. Then they'll give you a tag you can print out and put on the box. So all the instructors, instructions are on this link, and I'll have that on our website and our Facebook page today. This is an amazing way that we can practice being rich and touch thousands. Our, our church here in Seymour, Indiana, could touch thousands of children all over the globe just through this one project. I can't think of a, a better way to spend your Christmas money. And then the next thing we can do is what I'm going to just call Be Rich Sunday. On November 12th is our harvest offering. And last year, you saw, that offering was close to $30,000. This year, that offering is going between uh, three different places. Number one, it's, it's going to go into some of our general fund. And some have gotten a little nervous when I've said our general fund is a little low. We have many funds in the church, different uh, item, line items, and most of those funds are just fine. But benevolence and the general fund have taken big hits this year because we've spent so much. 
um, the general fund pays for things like the big tailgate uh, lunch that we had a few weeks ago that was so awesome. We fed over 600 people. It was a great outreach. But so that's depleted the general fund a little bit and some of those other events like that. So we need to build that up. But the other place that that offering is going to go is to help the people in the Dominican Republic that Michelle ministers to that were hurt by Hurricane Irma. Many of you have asked, how can I help? How can I get involved with helping the people who have suffered from the hurricane? We have a very real positive way that we can reach those people and help them in the Dominican Republic uh, that, were, that were hurt by Hurricane Irma. And that's an amazing need. So that's where this offering is going to go. And I would love to see this offering do better than it did last year. It can. It can and it should. You guys are so generous. I'm excited to see what God does through us with these two things. As you start filling up your shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child, bring them here. We're going to line them up on the stage. My prayer is that by the time we get to November 19th that you can't even see me at the piano. I would love that. Let's fill this stage up with boxes and let's do a great offering on November 12th. That's how we can practice being rich. You see, the reality is that God's extravagant generosity towards us compels us to be extravagantly generous towards others. You know, God is so, so generous. I was just home seeing my son's final senior football game and the time that I spent with my wife, we had dinner together, we just hung out together. It was so precious. I am a rich, blessed man beyond any measure. We all have those things in our life that we can sh that, that is so clear what God has given us. But it's also important to know that in Jesus' day, people didn't necessarily give to the poor. That was kind of a foreign thing to them. We don't understand that in America. We're kind of trained because of the church and because of how Christians act to give to the poor, but it wasn't that way in Jesus' day. And yet he said things like this, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. These, these were radical teachings that Jesus gave to people in his day. The way things worked in that day is you gave to the tax collectors. You gave to rich people so they would bless you. It was kind of, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of deal. And yet Jesus shows up in the middle of that and comes up with a completely different ways, way to work. Look at what he says, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. This would have blown the minds of the early church. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked, and he wants us to be. The early church was so noted for being generous that when Emperor Julian came along in 325 AD, the church, the Roman world had already uh, changed over to Christianity by the time this man came along. But he decided he was going to take Christianity out of the picture and go back to worshiping pagan gods and pagan rituals. And he couldn't get his people to do that because the church was loved. And what Emperor Julian find up wound up finally saying was the impious Galileans support not only their own poor but ours as well he couldn't get them to stop being Christian because the Christians were so loved for their work for the poor that's what Seymour Christian Church should be known for in our community that these crazy Christians they not only take care of their own poor they help everybody else's poor. That's what Christ wants of us. Some people will say, well, is it a tithe? Is it 10%? What is it? You know, the tithe was an Old Testament principle. I, I think it's a good principle. It's a good place to start. Be generous. Just do what Jesus said. Be generous. Help those who need help. Do, 
help those who come into your life that the Lord puts there and be generous to them. You see, no strings attached generosity was the hallmark of the first century church, and it should be the hallmark of Seymour Christian Church. Do good for those who can't or won't do anything good for you. Just help them. Just bless them. When these shoe boxes go out to the world, they're just given to the children and they're told. You saw it in the video. Jesus loves you. This is free. It's yours. Just take it. That's the type of love and that's the type of generosity that will change our world for Jesus. And that's what we want to be about. Be generous people. You see, what the Lord knew is that where generosity leads, the heart follows. Some of you are already upset. I said, don't get white elephant gifts because you've already been buying them. You've got a closet full, right? It's okay. I'm not trying to shame you for that. But we can do so much better than that. We can do so much better than that. We can, we can be generous. We can follow the Lord's lead. You see, Jesus said, for where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Look at that verse. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Where's your treasure this morning? Where is it? You see, God knew that the competitor for your soul would be your stuff. When I get up here and preach... I never really get up here worried that I've got a bunch of people out here trying to decide between worshiping Satan or worshiping God. Let's see. Hmm, should I worship Satan or God? No, that's, he's no competitor. That's not a competitor for your soul. I know some people do, but that's not the norm. I, I don't have people sitting out here going, should I raise my hands and sing to the Lord Jesus or should I go bow down to a pagan idol? That weren't, that's not us. But man, our stuff, that's the competitor for your soul. And that's why Jesus taught so much about it. More than grace, more than baptism, more than any other teaching combined, Jesus talked about your money because he knew that it was your stuff that was going to compete for your soul. God doesn't want you to feel guilty this morning, He wants you to be grateful. He's blessed you with so, so much. And the truth of the matter is, some of us here today, we can't be generous because we're strapped. We've already got too much stuff, and it's killing us. We already have too nice a car. We already have a bigger mortgage than we should have. And it's ruining our marriage. It's ruining our relationships. It's hurting our relationship with God. It's killing us. And God didn't want that for you. He didn't want you to be bound to the things of this world. When you become a Christian and you start to follow the things that Jesus taught and to do the things that Jesus asked, he called you to leave, a, leave the old ways behind and to start a new life. And part of that life is being generous. It's reaching out to those in need. And when you start to do that, you're gonna find out something really amazing. You can't possibly outgive our God. You can't. So this morning, if you're strapped, I, I wanna tell you there is hope for you. Right after the first of the year on our Wednesday night Bible studies, we are going to go into a study to help you understand some biblical principles of how to deal with your money so you don't have to be strapped. We can help you get out of that debt. And it might seem impossible. I've had friends that were forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars in credit card debt, and they used these principles from God's word, and they they got free of it, they got clear of it through God's help. And we want to help you with that. So on Wednesday nights, right after the first of the year, that's what our Wednesday night studies are going to be about. What I would love is for you to bring some of your friends who maybe don't know the Lord and bring them to dinner at the church and we'll teach them how to be good with their money and how to become unstrapped. That's, we'll do that. 
I'll be glad to help you guys with that. I, the Lord doesn't want you to be burdened down that way. But if you're there, you know why Jesus said you can't serve both God and money. And you can't. You just can't. But when you start to become generous and to give and to share, it's contagious. And it's going to affect you. It's going to affect those around you. It's going to affect our church. And then our church is going to affect our community. And our community is going to affect the world. It's a powerful thing for us to be able to do. And so this afternoon, when you get home, Look on the website. Start filling up those shoe boxes. Follow the instructions on the website. Start putting aside some money for that harvest offering. Pray about what the Lord would have you to give. And be generous. The Bible says that God says, test me in this. Prove me in this. He wants to be tested in your generosity. And he is faithful. I'm, I'm not a health and wealth preacher. My mom would, my folks are the most amazing picture of people who tithe and give regularly. And my mom would say, you know, sometimes it was hard to go without eating out that week. It would have been easier. But it was better. God blessed us in immeasurable ways because we gave that money to him. This morning, I know that some of you here may not know Jesus in a personal way. And I understand, look, growing up in church, that doesn't make you a Christian. Doing good things. You could give all the money you have to the poor, but if you don't know Jesus, it's not going to save you. There's a reason why we're generous, and it's because the Lord lives in us. And if you don't have that relationship with him, we want to give you that opportunity this morning to come and Give your heart to him. We're going to sing a song of invitation. You could come right down and give your life to him right now. If you want to get baptized, we could do that right today to show that you've made that commitment to the Lord. We could do that this morning. There might be some in this room that you would just like to come down and let us know that you're identifying your life. You want to join Seymour Christian Church and be a part of our family. We had four people in first hour come and place their membership here. I got to tell you, It may feel like we've been through some hard times, and we have. But God is going to do some amazing things in the life of Seymour Christian Church in the weeks and months and years to come. Our best days are ahead of us. Our best days as a church are ahead of us. They're in front of us. And God is going to use us in some powerful, amazing ways. Tell your friends. Tell your family what's going on here, what God is.